Uh, hello, my name is Ben Morrell. As uh, my colleague said, I'm a steam turbine engineer for Eon Technologies, and I was part of um, the panel of inquiry into the last stage LP blade failure at Ironbridge that occurred in February last year. So, as I said, at 6 a.m. during a run-up on Unit 1 on the 4th of February, one of the last row blades at Ironbridge detached. That caused a significant imbalance, uh, a huge level of vibration, and that led to uh, the hydrogen seals in the generator um, failing and fracture of the oil pipes. That led to an extremely large fire, but fortunately there were no injuries. Now, that may have been partly to do with the time of day that the uh, incident occurred, but also the operation staff deserve a lot of credit because they acted instantly to purge the hydrogen and to isolate the oil supply. That contained the fire to the Unit 1 area, stopped it spreading to the rest of the power station. I'm going to give the game away uh, from the very beginning and say that the damage that you're about to see was extreme and given that the station is due to close later this year, it was uneconomical to repair. However, the investigation on the Unit 1 failure was, very, was still very important because we wanted to get Unit 2 back into service as quickly but safely as possible. So let's have a look at the damage. Um, first, just to give us an overview of the turbine area, um, you can see here this blackened area. That's the generator region where the uh, fire began and burned most intensely. I actually quite like this photo down here which shows the deformation of the railings next to the generator, just purely caused by the heat. I find that quite illuminating. Um, also of interest, you can't quite see it in this photo, but just where that dot is, is a broken window. It's about eight meters up from the turbine floor and about 15 meters away from the turbine itself. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. Just also to point out for the next slide, this component here. That component is the exciter, which you can see is not where it should be. It should be about here, and it's over here, and it's upside down. Um, that exciter weighs about six tons. That, to me, gives a real clear picture of just how much energy was involved in this failure caused by this initially one blade coming off. Uh, you can also see here detachment and severe bending of that thick shaft on the exciter plus the exposed pipe work, et cetera. Uh, now that broken window that I mentioned, um, that was caused by the exciter bearing cap being thrown from this area right the way through that window, that 15 meters across, eight, eight meters or so up. That bearing cap was, is in excess of 100 kilos of material and that again, just it demonstrated to me just how much energy was involved in this failure. So if we just move on and talk about the bearings in a little bit more <coughs> detail, you can see from this top left picture, this is an LP bearing, but it's actually quite typical of the damage that we saw um, where the uh, top of the bearing cap is just fractured, missing parts. You can also see this bearing keep, keep here that is, um, that's misaligned and has come apart just from the heavy, heavy contact between the rotating and the stationary parts. Um, just here we've got a different bearing keep with a very large through wall crack in it. Um, I also quite like these two bearing photos here, which again just demonstrate how heavy that contact must have been. You can see here, this is the bottom half of the bearing shell. It's been heated up to a point where it's stuck to the rotor and been dragged around with the rotor. And this bearing shell here for the top half has just deformed completely. We have a look at two of the couplings. This is the IPLP coupling where we can just about see in this picture that a lot of these studs have become loosened. And you can just about see some of the misalignment there if you look closely. Uh, more dramatically, again, we go back to the exciter, where we can see here this fractured metal area, these studs that have been torn out, um, plus just general damage around that coupling face. Um, just to focus on the idea of that heav heavy rubbing, the rotating stationary parts contact, uh, this photo here is from LP2, the effect, the LP with the failure on it. But it's from a completely different stage, it's from the opposite flow, it's on stage four. 
But you can see here, this material at the front of the shroud just being completely worn away. Um, in this picture here, this is actually LP3. Um, so that's on one of the non-affected or non-failure LPs. But you can see these tip seals on stage five are, again, completely worn away. And that was typical of all of the stage five and six blades across all three, uh, all three turbines. Where the, uh, where the clearances are a bit smaller, and the gland segments, again, you can see the heat generated there, a lot of contact damage. And on the interstage diaphragm seals, where we've got actual metal tear in there. I'll just have a look at those stationary components in a bit more detail as well. So you can see here, this is stage four diaphragm. Very thick walled component where we've got a large through wall crack that's been generated by that contact. More crack into very large thick components. So by now, when we look at the, uh, the, diaphragm, uh, the casing from the electrical end of stage of LP2, where the failure itself occurred, this extreme damage that we can see here is probably starting to become less of a surprise. So just focusing in on that failure region itself, you can see here, this is uh, the blade that failed, and it took 11 of its um, adjacent blades with it. And just remaining, uh, the remaining blades, this is the, what the blade tips on that st particular stage look like. So this, uh, this shows quite clearly why there was such a huge imbalance and why the vibration levels were so high and therefore what led to all this consequential damage that we've seen. So to get a little bit more technical, um, we'll focus on the actual failure surface itself. So the failure initiated at the trailing edge here, um, within those, that heavy erosion area, within those erosion notches that you can see quite clearly. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell on the, on the uh, metallurgy of this because that's not my specialism, but um, I was told that we also got found the, su the subsurface wormhole defects within these erosion notches as well, which has been heard of, but I wouldn't describe as common. And it's just, it's something that's worth bearing in mind when you start to see this heavy erosion of this type. Looking at the fracture face itself, um, I'm told by our metallurgy team that this smooth surface and these beach marks are quite clear indicators of uh, high cycle fatigue type failure. You can just see the rough final ductile fracture surface there. It was very important to establish that it was a fatigue type failure because that allowed us to, um, allowed us to understand the time frame of the failure itself. We knew it wasn't just a one-off, uh, say, mechanical impact incident. And we knew that it was unlikely to be something that's been going on for a very long time, like a period of years. By establishing this type of uh, metallurgical analysis and the results of that, we knew that it was almost certain to be a vibration type phenomena that would have taken place over the course of weeks to maybe months. And that allowed us to focus the investigation in so we can start looking at the real crack growth driving mechanisms. So to talk about those uh, potential crack growth driving mechanisms now. Uh, there were two potential hypotheses put forward by the investigation panel and again I'm going to give the ending away right at the beginning and say that the panel found that there wasn't definitive evidence for either one although both were plausible and we'll go on to see why we didn't necessarily have to uh, have to differentiate between the two. But just to explain both hypotheses for so the first was locked on half speed impacting. And that's a very specific vibration, um, vibration characteristic that we can see whereby a rotating component will make contact with a stationary component, but only very momentarily. So it doesn't rub as such and create that, uh, that heat transfer and thermal bending that we'd normally associate with a rub. Just makes a momentary contact and then it gets pushed away. So the following rotation, that contact isn't made. But then, due to the lack of that contact, on the third rotation, it, the contact is made again, and so on and so on. So it's contact in every other revolution. 
That means that this type of vibration is character characterized in the data by being exactly half running speed. So you can differentiate it from oil well, which is just under half running speed. And also you can see it, it comes on very suddenly and it goes off very suddenly as well. Mm. Now, um, the LP rotors of this design at uh, this station and at other stations that have this L these LPs have known more or less since commissioning that these rotors are characterized with a light shrink fit between the LP shrunk on discs and their spindles. Now that light shrink fit leads to uh, an asymmetric heating characteristic between the discs and the spindles during, um, during cold and warm starts. <coughs> so because of that asymmetric heating, that leads to thermal bending, which we've traditionally seen as just an increase in the once per rev vibration during the cold and warm start. Now, every station in the country who has had, um, who uses these turbines have traditionally controlled this by different startup methods. And at this station, they use pressure warm starts. Now that gets extra heat into the LPs, which means that that asymmetric heating goes on for a shorter period of time and the rotor straightens out um, more quickly, so the vibration is reduced. In 2007, following an outage on this particular unit, it was noted that, probably just due to a slight variation in the build, um, the once per vibration was getting just a, a slight bit higher than it had in the past, and that was leading to this 25 hertz impact in introducing itself, as I described just now. Um, However, we have online condition monitoring on these, and it was deemed to not be a particular problem at the time. The second hypothesis is called flutter, which I'm going to define as blade resonance uh, excited by unstable flow conditions. So we know about blade resonance from some of the presentations that have already happened this morning. Um, and in order to generate these unstable flow conditions, typically, or Potentially, we need a combination of low flow, which during run-up we will get with full speed no load operation, low pressure, which this unit tended to generate a very good vacuum of the 30 millibars order, and low temperature, which we'll leave for the time being. The reason why flutter was brought up as a potential, um, potential cause of failure was simply that it had been noted on other LP blades, not, not necessarily this blade design or these type of stations, but it had caused failures on other LP, on other last stage LP blades. So I'm going to talk about just a little bit of the evidence behind each one, and you can draw whatever conclusions you want. So just looking at the evidence for the locked on half speed impact in first. Here you can see on the x-axis of this graph describes the maximum once per air vibration level, so the size of that thermal bend that I've already described. The further to the right of the graph where any of these data points get, the larger you can regard that thermal bend as being. On the y-axis, we've got how much of that 25 hertz impact in that we've seen. So you can see, during 2010, all the green data points didn't really occur. Yes, we got high vibration levels, high bend levels during, during your run-ups, didn't really lead to the impacting. During 2011, once, really. And suddenly, during 2013 and the beginning of 2014, note that in 2012 the, ma the machine didn't run very much, um, suddenly we're getting a lot, of high, uh, a lot of incidents of this high 25 hertz impacting. You can also note that there are more blue points over to the far right hand side of the graph. Now that means that the thermal bend itself was larger during 2013 and 2014. Although, even at, other le even at somewhat normal levels of bending, we were getting more impacting. And that was a significant change over the course of that weeks to months sort of timeline that we were talking about previously. Looking at the evidence for flutter, you can see here that this is, the num this is the LP exhaust temperature. So each of these points within a bar represents 
one uh, one instance, one start of either unit one or two running up at this temperature or less. So there's a cutoff point at April 2013. And each unit, you can see from the uh, key here, uh, April, we look at the unit before and after April 2013, and we also compare unit one to unit two. And what's important about this graph are these tall red bars here. They show that on unit one, after April 2013, the unit was basically running up significantly colder more often. Um, and on average, it was about 20 degrees colder than its own history or than its comparable unit, unit two. So that, again, is a significant change within the period. Now, you remember that I said that we needed low flow, low pressure, and now we have low temperature. So the conditions for flutter are fulfilled. We don't have any blade vibration monitoring or dynamic pressure probes, which we would need to further prove the existence of the flutter. But what that does show is that the conditions where flutter could occur or already exist. So what would lead to this change, these changes of conditions at about that time? Well, it was found that in April 2013, following a short outage, the LP coolant spray valve was left in the test on position. So that meant that during every run-up, not on load because the pump was turned off, but during every run-up, we were <coughs> constantly spray cooling. So <coughs> that's obviously unnecessary. Now, that's clearly led to the reduction in exhaust temperatures that we've seen in the previous slide. But that also has other adverse effects as well. Um, it effectively removes all of the positive effects of the pressure warm starts. So we can't get the heat into the LP rotors anymore. And that what, that's what led to the, uh, the data points on the impacting <coughs> graph being moved over to the right. And potentially, the colder conditions have just led to clearances closing ever so slightly, just enough to bring that impact <coughs> in. And again, that's why potentially we start seeing the 25 hertz impact in at the LP2 rear where we hadn't previously seen it in the past. It's also possible that uh, temperature, well, it was true that the temperature was reduced to less than the uh, saturation temperature of the steam, which will mean that there are water droplets now in the area. And that could have led to increased erosion, but the picture isn't quite that simple as you'll see in a sec. So why is this important for Unit 2? Because now our focus really is on, get, on getting Unit 2 back into service. Well, we can now say that because the spray valve has been operated correctly on Unit 2 for the duration of its life, that it's highly unlikely that any of these adverse effects on Unit 2 will actually occur. Coupled with that, if... <coughs> If it's the 25 hertz impact in that has driven this crack growth, unit one and unit two have different rotor dynamic characteristics. So you can see from this chart here, on unit one, when the, uh, when the thermal bend begins, the vibration simply goes pretty much from the origin and moves out, increasing in amplitude at a similar phase. On unit two, the dynamic characteristic of the rotor doesn't do that. The, uh, initially, the thermal bend opposes the natural imbalance of the, uh, of the turbine itself. So the vibration level, the vibration moves towards the origin initially before coming back out. And that means historically we've seen a lot lower vibration levels on Unit 2 compared to Unit 1. And we have never seen the 25 hertz impact in. And it means that we probably never would. So just move it. Just moving on. Um, however, even though we now have the confidence that neither of the potential crack growth mechanisms uh, are likely to occur on Unit 2, it's still obviously best practice to go into Unit 2 and have a look. And this is what we found. So you can see highly variable levels of erosion between these conveniently adjacent blades, where we've got hardly any erosion on this blade 
very heavy erosion that's similar to the fail blade on this one and in between. And that was exactly the same picture that we saw on unit one. I went back and forth between the different units trying to convince myself that the erosion was worse on unit one and that just wasn't the case. It was similar on both units. And because of that, we decided that we had to take some form of remedial action to get rid of those stress concentrating erosion notches that we're seeing here on unit two. So that work took place over about approximately nine 24 hour days where we had a night shift, which I was on doing the quality assurance, and a day shift where one of my colleagues was doing it. And this is the result of that. So this is not photoshopped. This really did look like this kind of mirrored finish that you can see there with absolutely no erosion, no stress concentrators in there. Um, a colleague of mine and I actually spent the first, the first night shift just experimenting with different equipment and different uh, kind of grinding techniques in order to achieve that sort of result. Uh, we were experimenting on the, um, on the remaining blades left over on unit one, which we could access. Um, you might also just about be able to see that we've just taken the trailing edge back into the cord of the blade as well, uh, just to restore its original thickness, and then just rounded it off, taking away any potential stress raises there as well. Now, that remedial work combined with um, the fact that we're confident that that crack growth driver mechanism doesn't exist anymore, that gives us the confidence now that we can put Unit 2 back into service. So, in conclusion, and hoping I've used up enough time of the session, uh, in conclusion, this was a major failure, the like of which I haven't seen in my 10 years in the power industry. But it was caused by a series of events and problems that were all linked in and lined up. And if you'd taken one of them away, the failure wouldn't have occurred. One of the real positives about this uh, project, I suppose, um, was Eon being proactive enough to put together a dedicated investigation team that took, took in steam turbine engineers, vibration ana analysts, and metallurgists from Eon Technologies, from uh, the site itself, and a representative from Alstom too. And by having that dedicated team, we were able to make this progress in investigating that root cause and performing the remedial work and returning Unit 2 to, to service within a matter of weeks. <coughs> and that was commercially highly advantageous. As I said, the remedial work on Unit 2 really did give us extra confidence. But another learning point that I've taken from this is um, that stations need to give a little more consideration to overuse of sprays. Uh, stations are very good with <coughs> getting sprays on when the unit gets to, uh, gets to the temperature limit. But when speaking to operators, you discover that they don't really, they're, they're much less concerned, and they've been told a lot less about the, the potential pitfalls of overspraying, which um, conveniently was in the previous presentation. Uh, and finally, the last learning point is just to always avoid the complacency. This blade had been in service for over 30 years and was regarded as a highly robust design. It hadn't suffered from some of the dynamic problems with other last stage LP blades, which again, we've talked about in previous presentations today. But just what appear to be fairly small changes in the operational conditions around the turbine suddenly had an absolutely massive impact. Thank you very much.